USCHO.com. Welcome to USCHO Spotlight for January 4th, 2023. Each week we talk to a coach, player, administrator, or journalist about college hockey. This podcast is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division I Frozen Four, April 6th and 8th, 2023 at Amelie Arena in Tampa, Florida. Secure your seats at NCAA.com slash MFrozen4. I'm Ed Trefsker alongside Jim Connolly. There are six teams playing independent schedules this season in college hockey, and one of them is Alaska Anchorage in its first year back, fresh off a weekend sweep of then number 13 UMass Lowell. The Seawolves now head up to Maine for a pair of games this weekend. And we're joined now on USCHO Spotlight by the head coach of Alaska Anchorage. That's Matt Shazby. Uh, Matt, what a weekend it was for your team. Uh, It's been an interesting year, I know, but... To go on the road and uh, pick up two wins against a nationally ranked opponent in UMass Lowell uh, has to feel good for the guys. Yeah, it does. You know, it was kind of the perfect storm coming out of Christmas break where you had a team that in UMass Lowell that hadn't played a ton of hockey recently. And uh, we kind of came in with a new fresh mindset of, of learning what we uh, kind of taking what we could from the first half of the year and heading into the second half of the year, being excited uh, to show up to the rink and, and be high, highly competitive and it's going to take some pretty pretty special moments from from players for us to be winning games, especially a team of the caliber of UMass Lowell. And we got that Friday night with Jared, Jared Wells' performance in the net. And then that kind of carried over into Saturday, our confidence from winning that game Friday night. You kind of have the, the adrenaline going, and I feel we executed a pretty, pretty solid uh, system there Saturday night that allowed us to get the win. I want to start right there in goal. <clears throat> um, you end up... Uh, you know, going with Jared Whaley, he'd only played, uh, had a couple of stars going into the season. A fantastic uh, 52 save performance on night one. Uh, then night two, you went back to goal, Nolan Kent, a grad transfer who you've been, you know, riding for much of this season. Mm-hmm. Most people would say, hey, you just had this hot hand. How do you change goaltenders? But the decision worked out. Was it a difficult one to make? And was it somewhere you'd kind of maybe talk to these guys before the weekend and made some promises? No, yeah, I mean, we the coaching staff discussed how we would kind of wanted to handle the goalies in the second half and getting Jared whale games, uh, more consistently is a big focus for us. We're, you know, we, like you said, we only played him in two games, the whole first half of the year. And he was exceptional. The one game he played against Arizona state. So we kind of got to see what we're working with a little bit. Guys excited about the second half of the year. You know, we wanted to bring in our transfers and we wanted to allow them to play. Uh, and they're going to still continue to play. But again, Jared's going to be getting probably at least one game every weekend as we move down the second half here. And, and so really it's going to be kind of, um, you know, for the most part, Nolan and, and uh, Joey, you know, whoever's playing better between those two will probably be getting the second game each weekend. Go through some of your players on your team. I was lucky enough to call that series uh, this weekend for ESPN Plus. Really enjoyed watching your team. And a uh, guy that stand, stood out was uh, Max Helgeson. Uh, I know he had a three point game on Friday night. Can't remember if he got on the score sheet on Saturday, but it just seemed every time the puck was around somebody in the offensive zone, he was usually near that puck. Uh, what, do you, what do you like about his game and the way he plays? Yeah, he's a kid with, you know, he's, he's kind of an old school player where he's, He's been a hockey junkie. I've known him for his whole life. He just loves the game of hockey. And so he does a really good job of anticipating and reading plays. And he has an exceptionally long stick that allows them to, he allows them to disrupt things uh, defensively in the offensive zone. He's able to get the guys with that reach and, and stick lift and, and steal pucks. And then when he does get it, you know, that kind of that hockey junkie side of him is he's, I've always seen him with a ball and a stick or some, some sort of stick in his hand doing something where, He's got an elite set of hands on him that allows him to make plays in tight areas, you know, put passes through triangles and find guys on weak sides. Kind of how he did with Bamber's goal from behind the goal line. And, you know, he, he's just one of those kids that when we were building the program and he's a hometown kid that was playing off at Lindenwood. Uh, he's one of the first, you know, conversations that we had about building this team around a kid like that. You know, and he's, he's been great for us and we're looking for some, some big things from him the second half of the year. 
You just mentioned defenseman Brett Bamber scored uh, the the winning goal on on Friday night, but I was impressed with all of your defense: uh, Derek Hamlin, Brett Bamber, Will Will Gibson. Not afraid to jump into the offense, and you guys, when you attacked, and I know that it was a, a, you know a puck possession type series that you didn't really win the p- possession game, but you came out on on front on the scoreboard. The defensemen got into the the act, and they knew when the right time was to move. How difficult is that to teach? And uh, you know, in do so in a way that you're you're not trying to take away offensive creativity, but you also don't want to see three on ones going the other way all night. Yeah, we've learned some pretty tough lessons the first half of the year. I mean, if you look at the plus minus of of Gilson, you know, we've 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 encouraged his creativity, we've encouraged his offense, but it's one of those things where we've had to teach the, the right time and when to go. And you, know, you can do some things in practice. You do some video. Uh, you, you let them watch themselves. You know, you, you you kind of put them on somebody in the NHL that wants to play a similar style, and you watch their tendencies. Uh, but you know. At the end of the day, if we're going to be creating offense, it's going to come from kind of the offensive group that we have on the back end and being that second wave off the rush or, or diving in the weak side on the offensive zone. And so, you know, we're, we're happy with the development that's taken place the first half of the year. And like I said, we've, we've definitely worn, uh, or we're definitely leading some leaderboards in uh, some golf tournaments. <laughs> A couple of those young freshman defensemen where we might, we might have the worst plus minus in the country, to be honest. So. Um, but it's something that they're getting better at. And, you know, if, if you watch that series, like you mentioned, was they did pick the right times and they really limited uh, giving up much on, on the defensive side of things just because of the way we've kind of been able to rein them in a little bit and teach them when the right time is to go. Matt, in the process of rebooting the program, you've been able to take advantage of the newer rules with the transfer portal, plus some players with fifth year eligibility combined with some recruits, what's the process been like to pull that together? And, and secondly, how does having a group of players with some college hockey experience help get things going? Yeah. I mean, that was, you know, when I showed up on the job and walked in the doors on November 1st of last year, you know, we had zero hockey players. And so then it was coming up with a strategy of how we're going to build the team. Um, and, And obviously the recent movement with the transfer portal played into our favor. Um, it was building a freshman base early on before the portal really popularized. And we were able to do that. You know, we, we targeted some key guys that were in leadership positions throughout all the junior leagues that were still available. I mean, when you come in to a recruiting class of the 20 year olds, you know, there's, there wasn't that, you know, you're narrowing it down to 20 guys, pretty much a couple defensemen, a couple of forwards in, in all of junior hockey across North America, because, you know, it's so picked over by that point for a team to come in. Um, but we were really happy with the freshman base we were able to build going into uh, kind of that March, April transfer portal scene. Uh, you know, and the other big piece of it was being able to put some games on our schedule that those guys that are playing at big programs like Minnesota Duluth and Western Michigan and, and a couple other big schools across the country that you are going to come here and you are going to play, you know, big time division one hockey and you're going to have a great schedule. You're going to go to some incredible arenas and get to, get to really experience college hockey. So, you know, once we got to that transfer portal window, it was, it was hot and heavy. It was assistant coach uh, Murdoch. He was living in Minnesota the whole winter recruiting and and building the team. Um, And he would open the transfer portal up 6 a.m. in the morning, see who's in it, fire off an email to basically every single kid that's in the portal that morning. And then, you know, us being the low man on the totem pole, it's, you're not going to get a response from a majority of the guys, but the guys that did respond, you know, they, you had to kind of educate them on what they're getting themselves into and the potential of our program and, you know, the challenges that we face. But I feel like every guy that is here got excited about those challenges and got excited about the, you know, potential more or the opportunity to play more hockey, uh, the opportunity to, you know, help build a program and establish traditions and a culture or somewhere you know, it was the most, I think the most unique situation going into this season was our, our situation here at UAA. And we're really happy with the characters that we got, you know, the five, the, the fifth year was huge for us. Our five grad transfers have been absolutely phenomenal for us. Uh, unfortunately, we lost Tisdale in the Colorado College Series. 
Uh, but the other four that have continued on have just been incredible. Like you mentioned earlier, Nolan Ken's been a steady guy for us on in the net, and Derek Camlin's been the, kind of the leader of our decor and and been the the voice back there. And then you, know, you get guys Caleb Height uh, and and Jamie Collins that are just giving you every ounce that they have their fifth year of college hockey and you know, just the quiet leadership that they bring has allowed our freshmen you know, to to follow some guys that have been around the game a lot. And, and again, those guys are making us significantly more competitive than if the transfer portal wasn't there. You know, Augustana is coming in at a good time. They're going to be able to, to really take advantage of that. Robert Morris coming back. Stonehill is this transfer portal is with the growth of college hockey is going to allow those teams to be much more competitive. And, and, and the parity, as you can see with us, is, you know, four of our, our four of our wins are against top 15 teams at the time when we beat them. So you know, that that wouldn't happen in a million years if that transfer portal wasn't there. And, you know, it's 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 good for it's good and it's bad for college hockey. But, you know, for new teams starting out, I think it's it's allowed for them to be much more successful quicker. You know, and, and allows for those programs to have stability too, because now we have 15 players that have used up that one-time transfer portal, and our rosters are much much more stable than you know teams across the country that don't have 50 percent of the roster that's already used that one-time transfer. More with Matt Shasby in a moment. USCHO Spotlight is sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division One Frozen Four, April 6th and 8th, 2023, at Amelie Arena in Tampa, Florida. class it's the ncaa men's frozen four welcome to fandom 101 want to help your team rule the rink here's your assignment lesson one go big for every goal two when you bring it bring enough for the whole class and three attendance is encouraged but passion is mandatory the ncaa men's frozen four april 6th and 8th at amelie arena in tampa florida buy your tickets today at ncaa.com slash m frozen four class dismissed We're back with Alaska Anchorage head coach Matt Shasby. You mentioned getting some big name schools on the schedule. How was it to get this year's schedule together and how has it been working on the next couple seasons? You know what? I was very, very surprised and pleasantly surprised how a lot of the you know, coaches across college hockey reached out to me and offered games. Uh, willing to help us establish our program this season. Um, you know, and, and a couple of those guys that, you know, reached out early and forever in, indebted to and grateful for towards. And, you know, Coach Bazin was one of those guys that, you know, is, is, was helpful in building our schedule in year one. You know, Chris Mayett at CC offered games right away. Coach Powers at Arizona State offered games, you know, almost immediately. And then that allowed me to take those games. And then, like I mentioned earlier, to, to go to those recruits and to the, you know, mention UMass Lowell and Arizona State and Colorado College and a couple other schools uh, on our schedule, which really helped with our recruiting. So, you know, it was, it was, you know, a lot of cold call, cold call emails and just sending requests out to everybody in college hockey that were available and were willing to come play you. And we have a, a nice game guarantee potentially for you to come play us and you get the two games exempt. So really you get to play a 36 game schedule two extra home games that you're building, or if you wanted to go play somewhere else, uh, is a big bonus to throw us in your schedule, and especially to come play us. when In early October, when you know conference play hasn't started up, or maybe the Thanksgiving weekends or over Christmas break, the holes in conference schedules is if you can sneak up to Alaska and add those two extra games on your schedule, I think that's big for programs, the potential revenue that can come from that. Uh, and also just the experience for your players to come up to Alaska and, and say, you know, maybe during your four year tenure, if a school comes up once every four years, that class gets to experience uh, whether it's UAF or it's UAA one time, at least during the college days, a uh, college uh, hockey experience. So, you know, it's, it's, it's gone very well. You know, we had six club games this year, but those six club games, I think were, I built them all in the first half of the year. Uh, I wanted those games to be games where we were able to win and to experience what winning feels like. Uh, we won all six of those games. So technically we're sitting 
uh, as a 10 and 12 team that's first year in college hockey. You know, four wins against NCAA teams and six wins against club hockey teams. But, you know, those those were actually home games that we were able to get in our building that typically we wouldn't have been able to get against other NCAA teams. And so, you know, new college programs, I think for that first year is, from what I've learned is I highly recommend playing games that you are know you're going to be competitive and, and have a, a significant chance of winning. And also just getting home games and getting in front of your hometown crowd is huge too. But, you know, our schedule next year looks great. Uh, our schedule is all but done with one game remaining. We need to schedule one more game and we have some amazing opponents on our schedule next year. And I would say we probably have eight games scheduled for the 24, 25 season as well. So, Having that independent schedule, it, it's it's tough, but at the same time, it's I think living in Alaska and playing in Alaska, it's almost beneficial to recruit with and for our our overall experience of going to different buildings every year and, and getting to really see college hockey, whether it's NCHC and Big Ten and hockey East schools. Is, you know, that's something when I played at UAA, I never got to experience. You're in the WCHA and you're playing the same nine teams every single year going to the same rinks every single year. We would host a tournament to start the year for a non-conference game. And that was really it. That was your college experience. You know, our guys are going to be playing in every single conference almost every single year uh, from Maine to Arizona state to Northern Michigan. So, you know, it's, it's been great. And I, I've, I like the independent schedule, but we definitely need to continue those conversations about creating hockey West if you just want to give it a simple name now that we're playing in hockey East right now. So hopefully a couple more teams can, can come online here over the next couple of years and really establish college hockey in, in the West. Matt, before we let you go, I, I know we had talked about it before last weekend's games, um, but you know, and you brought it up, you played at Alaska, you are, you grew up in Alaska. Uh, you have coached a lot of youth hockey around Alaska. You played your professional hockey up there for the Anchorage Aces. Uh, the the ability to have somebody that is so in tune with the area, the, the general population, the culture, everything that goes along with what Anchorage is, uh, how advantageous do you feel that that is to, to growing this program? Yeah, I mean, I was able to walk in that first day and I knew every single character in the city of Anchorage, whether it be every youth hockey character, you know, at the state level within the state, even the you know, the coaches at UAF um, and the junior hockey programs, the three junior hockey programs that are up there, you have a relationship with them in some way. I mean, so that allowed me to focus on the bigger picture or the really just the team in general. I didn't have to focus on the community development and the community connection because that was already there. I and mean, that's something that our team is is growing every single day. But I have the connections and I have the ability, whether it's uh, through business relationships or it's the Seawolf Hockey Alliance that's helping operate our program with the university of me already knowing every single person on that board or, you know, wherever it may be, um, which allows, I think, our program to grow quicker because I'm not having to spend as much energy establishing those relationships within the community. And I can focus on us winning hockey games and working with my staff uh, to be successful on the ice and, and help our guys be successful in the classroom. So. You know, I think that was a huge part of me getting the job is, is having that connection um, with the community and, and having all those kind of steps ahead of, of somebody else coming in and having to spend so much time just being a, acquainted with the people of Alaska and the city and everything else. So, you know, if I think I was, I was, you know, the right guy to get this thing back on its feet and get going again, and hopefully I can get to do it a long time, but if not, I'm going to pour my blood, sweat and tears because I love this program and I have since I was five years old and love being a part of it. So you know, I'm, I'm always going to help this program grow. You know, and it's I'm very, very excited about our future. And I feel like we my staff has done an incredible job of, of getting it off the ground and, and uh, getting us to where we want to be here at the for the second half of the year. And we're excited about the prospects that are coming in uh, for next year. And we're we're. Um, you know, on, on to big, great things here at the University of Alaska Anchorage. Well, it certainly does seem that is, and I've seen that culture firsthand in my college days and loved, uh, 
UAA and the atmosphere that was always in the building. So it's a great little place, different than most places in college hockey, but, uh, but I wish you the best of luck in trying to regrow uh, what was a great program uh, for many years in Anchorage. And Matt Shazby, thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. That's UAA's Matt Shazby. Jim, fascinating to talk to Matt about the program. Certainly they picked the right guy for the job. They did. And, you know, I, I like the fact that he is uh, very forthcoming about the fact that he believes for good reason that he fit the bill. And he did. When you really think about, you know, what this program is, what its legacy was. I mean, don't forget that, you know, Brush Christensen took that team to three straight NCAA tournaments back in the early 90s. I, st- I still remember, it actually might have been the late 80s, but I still remember them walking into uh, almost a brand new Conti forum at Boston college and taking on BC and a best of three series and, and beating them. And that was at that point was the biggest upset in NCAA tournament history. You know, the Seawolves team that nobody even knew who they were. How did they get in the tournament? I mean, people were trying to figure out how they even got in, especially back then in the smaller tournament field, but they got in and won the game games on the road. And you, you think about, what the history of that program was. And I remember going up to Sullivan arena in 1993 for a two game series and it being just sold out. No students there on campus because it was break time and the, the, the community really supports them. And that's a city that Anchorage knows everything about every hockey team that's playing there, whether it's a junior team, whether it's a college team or whether it's a pro team, every fan that's a, a hockey fan knows all three teams. Well, um, and so they have a good tradition. Um, you know, they, they fell victim to a, a government that was tightening their belt, their belt straps. And, you know, at the time you looked at it and you said, Hey, yeah, well, whatever. One of the Alaska programs has to go. Well, that was never the right decision. And we, we learned right away that money could be raised and it was raised really quickly. They did find a, 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 basically, I guess, started kind of a nonprofit to help with the operation of this team. Um, as you heard Matt say, he's been in constant contact with those folks. He knew them though. That's, that's part of it. Say, so, so him knowing the roots of that community, having grown up, uh, you know, not too far away, having played there, having played his pro career there, having been involved with youth hockey there, he's just done it all. And I think that, as he said, he doesn't know how long he's in for it, but he's going to put every ounce of his blood, sweat and tears into it uh, because it means so much to him. I think you couldn't have picked a better time to be starting or rebooting an independent program. We talked uh, over the last couple of years about the transfer transfer portal, the pluses and minuses. But in this case, he's able to put together a team. And, you know, we've talked also uh, with Derek Schooley on our Monday podcast about that. Being able to have transfers and build a program gets you off the ground fairly quickly. And the other part of it with six teams playing independent schedules. You have the ability to get some games in February and even into March. So uh, the timing is great for the Seawolves to be restarting. I I think you're right, Ed. Um, You couldn't do this five, ten years ago. Uh, I mean, teams did it. I I remember Blaze McDonald starting up Niagara way back when, and he did it with a, a young class. And I don't know how to transfer his if he had many, he had some kids, but he had to identify a lot of talent. And then when you get through that four year cycle of players, you've just brought in a a class that was almost entirely freshman. Four years later, you're doing it again. And in between there, you don't have the ability to recruit too many players unless you had players that decide to leave the program. So you're talking about always having this massive four year cycle of big freshman classes. And that's kind of untenable. In, in college athletics because you it just puts so much of an onus on your, your assistant coaches to go out and recruit in that one to two year span, trying to get players back in four years later. It's so much pressure. The, the, the transfer portal took a lot of that off. I, if I remember the, the correct numbers, uh, 13 freshmen is are on uh, Alaska Anchorage right now, 16 transfers. So you're actually talking about a team that has more, upper class than you do freshmen. And that helps, uh, you know, obviously the, the one-time exemption because of COVID for these grad, grad players helped a ton. And the, those are the most experienced 
players, they, they show up on the ice and they, they, you could see it last weekend, the games I called, they were definitely uh, the best players on the ice, but you still have some really good freshmen on that team. It, it, it comes along, but you couldn't, I don't know how, I don't know. And Derek Schooley, who's on with us on Mondays, he had, he had to do this. He said he had 30 freshmen his first year as a coach. But he said he only graduated 15 and that's kind of what happens. You have some attrition, you have players that, that end up deciding not to come back. Then you can fill in holes, but it's still a less than ideal situation. I think that the transfer portal for teams like Alaska Anchorage for Augustana for even for Robert Morris, when they come back next year will be very helpful compared to what it was like to start up a program five, 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. And people might forget that Niagara in order to start up, spend its first two seasons playing in a D three league with essentially a D three schedule as it ramped up the program, a lot easier head start. Now, lastly, he mentioned getting a league together. I like the name hockey West. Uh, that may take five or 10 years to get together, but certainly just the early success that he's having and what Arizona state's been able to do Lindenwood as they get going, there's the opportunity there to show schools that this is feasible to start a program. You know, I, when I look at the the geography out there and I, my wife is from the uh, Pacific Northwest. So I'm kind of familiar with, you know, with the Portland, Oregon area, they have a very successful junior team. Um, the Seattle area is, is growing now with, with the Kraken uh, and they've had some junior teams in the past. And then you even, even Northern and Southern California, you know, there's some teams out there that are large, but they don't have to be massive, large schools. We know we look at the CCHA and the size of some of those schools. You don't have to be enormous schools to have some success and be able to operate a, a successful program. It's, it's usually comes down to what the uh, resources are of an athletic department. And, you know, I'm just I'm throwing a, a name out there like something that a, a, a small school that has become big quickly. Gonzaga, you know, had some runs to the tournament in basketball, uh, was the number one seed, I think, going into last year's NCAA tournament. But th they've had enough success at basketball that probably can fund some extra programs. It's whether they want to do it. And can you figure out that in eastern Washington, you'd be able to attract a crowd? I don't know. Um, but you know, a school like that, that has had some success in another division one sport that happens to be the most, most lucrative sport, uh, of the NCAA tournaments, potentially, um, you've got to, you've got to kind of pick and choose. And, and I think we've tried to do a good job of letting the schools come to us. And I, when I use say us as like the college hockey body, um, but I, I feel there's there's almost going to be a proactive identification and somebody almost to head up that hockey West movement. Uh, I know that college hockey Inc does a fantastic job and I know that they're doing a lot of that work, but it, it, their, their resources get spread thin as well. And I, I feel like if there will be a Western conference, and I do believe by the time I'm uh, in the ground and ready to end my college hockey career, there will be a Western conference. I see this happening in the next 10 years. Uh, but it takes a lot of concerted effort. Yep, I agree. And with that, we'll wrap up this edition of USCHO Spotlight. We've been sponsored by the NCAA Men's Division I Frozen Four, April 6th and 8th, 2023 at Amelie Arena in Tampa, Florida. Get your seats now at NCAA.com slash MFrozen4. You can find our podcasts at USCHO.com slash podcasts or subscribe on your favorite podcast app. For Jim Connolly, I'm Ed Trefsker, and this has been USCHO Spotlight.